Happy Monday, everyone. It's me, John Lorden, here with another episode of Brain Scratch, Case Cracked. Hope you had a nice weekend. Thank you so much for joining me here today. Um, I want to give a very big thank you to Brooke for suggesting today's case. And for today's case, we are once again going across the ocean to the United Kingdom. This is a story where we get a very big sense of tragedy, a little very bizarre cruelty, um, but thankfully it is a case cracked, so we're looking for that silver lining in terms of justice being served in this one. This is a story I like to call Finding Karen Buckley. 24-year-old Karen Buckley was originally from a small farming community called Morn Abbey in County Cork, Ireland. Actually, I have a bunch of relatives that live out in County Cork. Uh, a nursing graduate of the University of Limerick, Karen found a career path she was very passionate about. She moved to Glasgow, Scotland in January of 2015 to attend Glasgow Caledonian University and obtain her master's in occupational therapy. She has been described by her peers as being loved, respected, and admired for her ability to get on well with everyone. Karen was the only daughter to John and Marion Buckley, and she had three brothers. By all reports, she had a very close relationship with her family and a very bright future. On April 11th, 2015, Karen was enjoying an evening out with friends at a nightclub called The Sanctuary. Her friends say at around 1 a.m., she went to the ladies' room and she didn't return, and she left her jacket behind. Apparently, she left the club without telling any of them goodbye. Uh, when her friends hadn't heard from her by the afternoon of April 12th, they contacted Police Scotland. Soon, her image was being broadcast on local news, and investigators were focusing on her last known whereabouts. They heard from witnesses that Karen was seen talking to a man outside the club. Her family immediately traveled to Scotland and held a press conference asking for help finding their only daughter. Detective Superintendent Jim Kerr of Police Scotland would lead the investigation. Over 500 officers would work on this case in some capacity, and the cost of this investigation is estimated to be somewhere between 400,000 and 500,000 euros in total. Investigators quickly found the man Karen was speaking to, 21-year-old Alexander Pacto. They brought him in for questioning and searched his home. He claimed that they had both gone back to his home, had consensual sex, and she left around 4 a.m. He also claimed that she hit her head on the bedpost, which might explain any of her blood being found in his home. Certainly a warning sign in that piece of information. Hundreds of police officers were searching for Karen. Local newspapers figured out the identity of, a of Alex Pacto and began running stories about him. This would prompt a co-worker of Pacto's to contact police. He told them that Alex used to store fireworks at a farm on the outskirts of Glasgow. Investigators checked that farm and made a horrible discovery in a storage shed there. Human remains were found in a plastic barrel filled with caustic fluids. An obvious attempt to dissolve the remains had not gone quite as planned. Detective Jim Kerr noted that Pacto's friends said he had made comments about attacking a woman and disposing of a body by using acids to dissolve it all away. Some of these comments were made even before the actual crime, which could certainly suggest a level of premeditation. He also noted that Alex Pacto may have been enjoying himself throughout the investigation. Here's a quote from Detective Kerr. Well, he seemed to enjoy the case, the entire process of being interviewed, of being released, of being detained later on. He had plenty of opportunity to tell us where Karen Buckley was, what he'd done with her, but he did not take that opportunity whatsoever. Pacto was actually at a Starbucks cafe when he was arrested. He was charged with the murder of Karen Buckley. Police say that Pactel killed Karen within about 20 minutes of meeting her. He offered her a ride home in his Ford Focus. Once in the car, he first tried to strangle her and then used a spanner, what we call a wrench here in the U.S., and apparently it was a pretty large one, to bludgeon her to death, striking her over a dozen times. He then took her body back to his apartment. 
Several hours later, Pactel went to a store, bought chemicals, gloves, and a mask. He tried to dissolve Karen's body in the corrosive chemicals first in his bathtub, but it, did, it didn't work, and his roommate was expected to be coming home that evening. Alex then took her remains and hid them in his home again. The following day, he bought a plastic barrel and more supplies. He put her remains in the barrel and took the barrel to the storage shed at the farm. A vigil was held in George Square. Hundreds of people gathered around flowers and pictures of Karen while Amazing Grace was played on bagpipes. Closed casket services were held for Karen, stealing the opportunity from her family to see her one last time before they had to tell her goodbye. Karen's family and friends were now preparing for the hardships of a trial, hopefully to find and serve justice to Pacto. But this case would take another twist. Pacto would wind up pleading guilty. Karen's parents traveled to Glasgow to hear Pacto's plead in person and then again later for his sentencing. Quote, to you, she was a complete stranger. In a matter of minutes, for some unknown and inexplicable reason, you destroyed her young life and devastated a family, the judge said. Alex Pacto was given a life sentence. The judge did want to give him as stiff a penalty as possible, but also wanted to respect his early guilty plea. She wanted to set his sentence at 25 years before he'd be eligible for parole, but then she also took off two years due to him pleading guilty. He will remain in jail for a minimum of 23 years before he can even apply for parole. Karen's father commented that a life sentence would never bring his daughter back and, quote, I hope that he is never released and spends every day in prison haunted by what he did. Pacto initially had other plans. He started the process of appealing his sentence, however, would later abandon his appeal only two days before it was to be heard by three judges. One year after her death, a ceremony in mass was held at St. Michael the Archangel Church, the same church that Karen made her Holy Communion, Confirmation, and where her Requiem Mass was held. Her parents, as well as extended family, gathered to celebrate her life and mourn her loss. There was also a very special gesture made from Karen's school. A spokeswoman for Glasgow Caledonian University said, During GCU's winter graduation ceremonies, Karen Buckley was awarded a posthumous Master of Science in Occupational Therapy. Her father was there to receive her degree. A new source of joy has also arrived for Karen's parents. A year after Karen's death, one of her brothers had a baby, and John and Marion are now grandparents. Meanwhile, Scottish police are looking for more information to bring Pacto back into courts. He had previously been charged with attempted rape of another 24-year-old back in 2011, when he was only 17 years old. They were walking under the pretense of finding a taxi to share when he tried to sexually assault her. Luckily, two men in a nearby balcony heard her screams and rushed to her aid. Alex was arrested soon after. This all took place less than one mile from the Sanctuary nightclub. He was acquitted by a jury, however, but Scottish laws allow a retrial if new evidence comes forth. On a television documentary called Disclosure, the Murder of Karen Buckley, Police Scotland are appealing to the public for new information to help that retrial happen. The woman who accused him of the 2011 attack also spoke to the Irish Times. Quote, From the moment I knew he was found not guilty in my case, I knew in my heart I would see his name again one day because he had hurt someone else. The Sanctuary Nightclub would also be featured in the news again just last week on September 24th, 2018. It was reported by the Daily Record that a 26-year-old man had to be rushed to the hospital after being stabbed inside the nightclub. That incident is still currently being investigated. And Pactel also has some concerns about his stay in prison. On top of being moved to another prison due to safety concerns, he has accused a few fellow inmates of urinating and spitting in his food. The director of Scottish Prison Service says his complaint was investigated, but there was no evidence to support it. Case cracked. 
Um, one of the things that really gets me about this case is Alex. It's the whole makeup of him meeting her within 20 minutes. Even his earlier victim from the attempted assault, uh, he had only met her a matter of minutes before he wound up attacking her as well. And in that disclosure documentary, which I believe I have a link to um, in the sources down below, if not, you could search it on YouTube and find it pretty easy. Um, there is someone trying to talk about the mindset that's going on there. And basically, he's picking these types of victims because he does not know them. He does not have any personal connection to them. He treats them merely as an object. And then to know what he did to Karen's body after the fact uh, certainly certainly fits into that story as well. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty rare that I look at someone and I say, you know, this person is just purely evil. I, I, I try to see both sides of, of any person that comes up in these cases. Um, but when it comes to Alex, it is really, really tough. And the documentary made a good run about it. If you watch the documentary, you'll hear about his backstory. Um, you know, he had a little bit of, of tough upbringing as well. Um, but I don't know, for me personally, it just it, it's very hard for me to look at him without thinking how evil that guy is for, for what he had done to Karen. Um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's really tough. Not very often that I hit a case like that. I'm happy that justice was served. I'm happy that he's going to be in jail for a while. I do truly hope that some more evidence comes forward so they can hit him with that charge from 2011, maybe tack some more years on. Uh, but this is a young guy and uh, there is certainly some possibility that he could be turned back onto the streets and after doing something like this, I don't know that I feel like that would be the best thing. Um, I don't know. I also didn't hear anything about any type of programs that he was put into in terms of his mental health. Uh, I don't know if there's something that they would do to try to make him realize what he's done. You know, the father's comment about that, I hope that he thinks about what he's done every day. Um, I think he's probably thinking about it, but I don't know that he's that remorseful. It just, it seems like he is so disassociated from what that really means that he ended someone else's life that uh, I just, I can't be positive that he is, is even recognizing that it was something that he shouldn't have done outside of the fact that, you know, he's now stuck in a prison, which is really, really terrible. And I like to think that humanity is a bit more dynamic and stronger than that in terms of its makeup. Um, but I don't know. He really makes me question that. And it does not happen that often for me. So case cracked. Um, yeah, sorry. I wish they could all be as kind of having the happy ending that we've seen in a couple of them lately. Um, despite the fact that justice was served in this one, it just, uh, the tragedy in it really, really sticks with me. Uh, a young woman looking to help others. She had already had her nursing degree. Uh, you know, was looking to specialize in occupational therapy. Um, it's it's really a sad thing, and this is a planet that needs more people like that. And it's terrible that um, we don't have Karen here anymore. Uh, speaking of the previous episodes, it's that time where we're going to talk about your comments on last week's episode, The Adventures of Joint Vincent, or his real name, Aubrey Carroll. Let's start with Kelly Rayborn. I'm sure he had his reasons, but I find it very selfish to put your family through something like this, especially if you have been a good parent to the child, like I'm guessing the mother was. He obviously had some issues with the dad, but he could have at least let his mother know at some point he was okay. And I basically, I wanted to show kind of what was going on in the comment threads there. And there are two distinct sides to um, how you guys are looking at that case. This is one of them. Many of you are very upset with him for hurting his family in that way, for leaving in that way, for not letting them know where he was. Um, the only thing I point to in terms of that side of the conversation is keep in mind that he had known from when he went and tried to stay with one of his friends and their mother basically kicked him out and said, we can't have you here. Um, I think he had some clue because of that experience that if he let someone know where he was, that maybe they could get in trouble for helping him you know, flee his family when, when he's too young to do that. So I think that by, might be a piece of the motivating factor and just the fear of being picked up and taken home. Um, that might be why he wasn't able to reach out to his mother. 
Uh, and, you know, keep in mind, we also had some things like it seems like there was notes left behind. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of details that we don't know about this case. So it's another one of those that I find it very hard to draw a hard line and say, this part was absolutely wrong, this part was absolutely right. But I do hear you guys in terms of considerations on both sides of that. Connie Beard, there are so many un unanswered questions regarding Aubrey. If he wanted to get away from his life with his father and or stepmother, why didn't he go to his mother or at least contact her shortly after he left? If he was unhappy living with his father, why not go live with his mother or an, even another family member? Uh, did his close friends know about any type of abuse or know that he was planning to run? Did he have previous knowledge of the group that took him in and wanted an adventure? Did he create that Facebook profile hoping that his mother's family would see it and realize it was him? Of course, I realize that we will most likely never have the answers to most of our questions, but my mind keeps coming up with new ones. Um, in terms of the question of abuse, the only thing I could really point to is the fact that Sheriff Dix did interview him about his motivations for leaving in the first place. And at least from the comments from Sheriff Dix, it seems like there wasn't anything criminal or anything really bad going on um, to him directly. And that's I'm only getting that from, you know, from the perspective of Sheriff Dix. Obviously, it would be much better to hear it from Aubrey. What was the reason why you left? Uh, so I'm not positive that there was anything that could be, you know, legally classified as abuse going on in there. Um, and there's another aspect here, the Facebook profile. I really wonder about that, too, because if you don't want to be found, are you going to use any names that are connected to you? Uh, to your previous life? Probably not. So I almost feel like that was a little bit of, of a half-hearted attempt on his part to uh, kind of put a message out there to his family that, hey, I'm, I'm still out here. Um, is it the best way to have done it? Probably not. And keep in mind, this isn't the same type of case where with Emily Paul, you know, we really had her being the, motivated, the motivating factor in terms of contacting police to let them know that she was okay. Here, he got found by the investigators. So it's it's not exactly the same um, in terms of who reached out to who. But responding to Connie's post was Bill Slocum. Uh, if he went to, to his mother at the start, it would have put her in the position of having to return Aubrey to his father's custody. Also, he was probably enjoying life with his wandering commune and didn't want it to end. It's a hell of an ordeal to put her through but he must have really not liked someone in his old house. So I agree, Bill. And once again, I'm just trying to show both sides of the conversation that was going on here. I know many of you were upset for him doing this. I'm guessing that you are you might be parents yourself and just thinking about what if I was in those shoes. Uh, and then we've got other people that are kind of staying open to there might have been something bad happening here. We really don't know enough. That's kind of the scope of where most of the conversation was uh, in the comments on this. Uh, this is going to be challenging. Moving on to another comment from Lyctus Morgans. Hope I said that right. To the people who say, how could he do that to his family? My opinion is maybe he was depressed and felt like he was a burden to his family and that nobody would miss him. And instead of hurting himself, he left the situation. Just an idea. I'm glad he's safe. Uh, once again, just I'm pointing back to we we don't know enough Um but it does strike me that in most of these scenarios, if someone leaves their home situation, there is a, motiva a motivating factor. Uh, and is it as important that all of us, if we heard it, could agree and say, oh, yeah, well, of, of course he should have left that? Who knows? There's a spectrum there of uh, how bad things could be or how, how bad they could be perceived. And sometimes that's enough to make people want to leave a situation. Stephanie Hall, I am so glad he's okay, but look at where these rainbow gatherings happened. They completely trash the area and then bail over and over, quote, for the environment indeed. Stephanie, thank you for sharing that. Very interesting perspective. You know, uh, I only looked into that as a footnote to the story and because I saw some people theorizing that might be the group that he ran off with. Um, pretty interesting to hear that perspective. As a matter of fact, Loltia also uh, commented on that. I live in Lumpkin County where the rainbow gathering happened, and you are correct. They trashed our poor mountain. Uh, kind of interesting. How can we be for 
you know, really helping the environment if we're uh, trashing the environment like that by having a bunch of people go there and leave trash behind and things like that. Um, very interesting points. And that's a big part of the reason why I really appreciate you guys adding that information in the comments. It always gives me different perspectives to consider and keeps me scratching my brain. So thank you guys for doing that. Hope you have a wonderful Monday. Take care, everyone. And I'll see you back here on Wednesday with a new episode of Brain Scratch Search Light.